Oh, no, man, it don't look no crazy shit. I mean, maybe rain on Sunday. I mean, like 90, 91. That's, yeah, it's just Arkansas. Huh. Yeah. You know, I was just watching the national news and they were saying that it was going to be hell on earth. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. The, our local weather guy is usually relatively close to what we listen to in the morning and I mean he's he's makes a big deal about saying, you know, when yeah it's time to think about that shit and, and he's really good about it. He's the goofiest motherfucker. <laughs> God man. Well he's I would definitely motherfucker, man. I would definitely trust your your local news over over the uh national news oh yeah he uh he 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 doesn't he doesn't say the shit other people say i mean he he does his own homework he he trains the uh he trains news anchors oh really yeah he'll get an assistant and, you know the motherfucker will fuck around with him and all that and then all of a sudden next thing you know the assistant is gone and you see the assistant on another station Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then train them and lose them. Well, no, I mean, uh, two of our local stations are are like a sister station Hmm. uh, with a news agency. They're sister stations, and so when bullshit weather comes, they join up and do joint broadcasts. Hmm. And 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 you know the. The the girl he just trained, uh, her name's Carmen Rose. She's the first female uh, chief meteorologist on a news station in Arkansas. So I mean, you know, that's kind of an art. It's cool following her because she does these doodles that go along with the weather and post them. You know, they'd be like, "Oh, it's a hot and sunny day," and then she'll draw a motherfucker playing tennis. And she's a pretty decent artist. <laughs> nice. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know. And she's big into tennis and uh, and and outdoorsy stuff. Of course, you know she's a meteorologist. She started out being a science reporter, but there just wasn't shit that they, they, they weren't. Yeah. That yeah. So and then she went into it, but she's smart. Right? You, you're not a weather person if you're stupid. That no. is complex math. Yeah. No. It, it takes it takes a little bit of brain to be able to do that. Sure. Well, and do it right. I right. Guess. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, I, sp- um, I, sp- I spent the day prepping out uh, stuff for. Uh, deep net. You guys are like right on the cusp of actually getting to Denman, which will be the last stop before going out into the deep black of space, in the unknown, uncharted space. So it's all unknown to me. I don't know jack shit about deep, deep night revelation. So I'm, I know you know I've I've had some spoilers here and there on Drenix. I try not to let them affect me. Of course. 
you know, I don't give a fuck what the storyline is supposed to be in, in, in Drenix. If, if I can kidnap somebody, steal something, or pull something over, I'm going to try it. And well, I would say that um, of campaigns that I have run that have lasted as long as the Pirates of Drenix has, is that that, that campaign has the most story-rich um, plot line that I've of any game I've ever run. I I think the only one that actually really came close was back in the day, uh, first edition Warhammer Fantasy role play. Uh, um, the Enemy Within campaign was pretty close, but uh, even that campaign, you're not talking about a campaign that's going to last three to five years in length, like uh, Drenax does. <laughs> and so, it's just consistently there's uh, there's something going on. Uh, are we even halfway through that Drenax? You are pretty much exactly at the halfway point, yeah. And I really hope we take over the kingdom, by the way. You know I'm really going to try to push for that. I don't know if I can know, talk Cameron into doing it. Yeah, but. I mean, that. like I said, that is a third option. Um, and, of course, you know, if you were, if the group were to go that third option, the obvious way of solidifying that... Uh, that rulership would be to go to have Ching Shi go through with the wedding of Princess Rao because then that makes her legitimate. So, yeah, uh, I think yeah. I'm gonna. Uh, I, I think what I'm gonna try to do on that, and I'm telling you this so that way you can either prep to deal with it or whatever, uh, is uh, I'm gonna try to do some uh, creative, uh, creative video editing of him being hurt, but make him live in front like we're going to get him some shit but do this assassination attempts and all that we've taken him to a safe location yeah it's really going to depend yeah he's he's pretty fucked up i um right but with some I haven't quite, video it, editing it's really going to like it's really going to depend on on the route that you guys take uh whether or not he'll live it's not even really up to a, a dice roll it's going to be well which direction is this story going of whether oleb will survive his injuries or not right well that's cool too uh because you know i don't know what you know i i'm pretty sure that at some point in the near future we're going to have like a big problem there's too many fleets being built and and so I'm thinking we're gonna have to deal with a real fleet of some badasses. Uh, yeah, too long. yeah, there, yeah, there, there's going to be, um, there is going to be a reckoning. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you guys are are fast tracking to a a big finish. Um, but I mean, we still have, man, there's still a whole bunch to do. So. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Gabriel. Yeah. How are you doing? Oh, trying not to get sick. Oh, sick again, eh? Sometimes. <sighs> are you are you experiencing like the early symptoms or something, or? Oh, everybody else in my house is sick right now. <laughs> okay, but like you're not having like a craving for brains or anything. <laughs> well, not yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you turn into a zombie, as long as you can make the dice rolls, I'm cool with you staying in the game. <laughs> I'm not racist. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have no problem with playing an online game with a zombie. Uh <laughs> No, but seriously, I hope y'all get better. Thank you, sir. So, you know, when we get down to do the collaboration thing we were talking about, Chris. Yes. What are you about, about thinking about making a mountain dragon? Instead of going with green, black, just it's a mountain dragon. Yeah. We yeah, can, I stat it. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I actually for um, 
for Brawnhaven, I actually created a new type of dragon. Oh. Um, that's what, specific what for that. It's a, a stone dragon. Um, they okay. are flightless, and their breath weapon is, is a cone of petrification. See, that would be an awesome, you know, uh, an awesome thing <laughs> to have in, in you know, uh, the 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 cover artwork. She's uh, supposed to have uh, it kind of geared up for a a. A, a suggestion thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's I knew it was going to take a while when I when I paid for it, but you know we weren't in a hurry anyway. Right. So I should should in the in the nearer future than before. We're closer to the time. <laughs> yes. Right. Supposed to have something, but I mean we we haven't really actually officially started. So no, I mean we yeah. we need to we need to hammer out a uh, um a, a an outline yeah an outline i mean it, it depends on how you how you decide that you want to go for it you know i mean oh i'm open if you to if you want I... if you want to do um a a story heavy um game similar to like a 5e adventure yeah. then then yes we're going to need to do a an outline but yeah. if you and, and outlines are never a bad idea but if you're doing a um <clears throat> If you're doing an old school where you're, or an old school adventure where you are relying more heavily on random rolls on a table, <clears throat> that doesn't require as in depth of an outline. All you need to know is what you want that partic- the particular areas to look like. Right. Well, because I mean, the dice see, the will idea, take care of everything yeah, else. The, the problem with it is, <laughs> is the idea that, you know, uh, bloom! All of a sudden, the party's on the run, and 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 very powerful forces have very large prices on their head, you know. So uh, it's 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 kind of difficult to railroad somebody in an open environment, you know. Right. When all of a sudden, you know, okay, you are now Broadhaven. This this whole region is you are now the most wanted, and and that sucks to be you. Well, and so one way to do. do one way to do that is to start the adventure that way. Um, yeah. Because, you know, like the opening scenes, you're wanted. Right. Because if you if you do it any other way, um, if you do it midway through the adventure, <clears throat> then one of two things happens. Either one, the players themselves have an opportunity to circumvent that, and then your whole story plot goes completely off the rails. Or... Yeah. Um, B, um, the the players or your potential customers cry foul because you have, in air quotes, removed player agency because oh, well, they didn't have know, an opportunity to circumvent and, and, any of this. And really, what well, it comes down to is it's circumventing ne- uh, expectations. If the right. players expect a campaign to be this way and it ends up being a different way, some people will get upset. Right. So that's that's uh, that's where you hear people bitch about railroading. Right. But so uh, so if you're going to do that, it needs to be, you know, page one. This is the situation, and this is why, you know, this is why you're adventuring, is, is a yeah. great, you know. You know, I, I, you know, the introduction and, and get together and all that, and then, you know, just real early in there, uh, it, it, I'm thinking guilt by association got got them wanted, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because they, they signed up with the fucking traveling entertainment company, and then all of a sudden the, the traveling entertainment, entertainment company had a bard that fucked the king's daughter or something like that. Yeah. And... And then disappeared, and and everybody knew it was him. And then maybe they got to try to go find the the bar dude that you know knocked up the king's daughter. Yeah, everybody uh, who has to, a jester's look, hat or shoes with bells on them is now wanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the party was hanging out with those people, and then you know you can argue it if you want, but the king has said dead. He, you're you're wanted dead. Yeah, uh, that yeah. that actually that could be a great opener for. A whole yeah. opening scenario that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the adventure. But, yeah, yeah, so 
the two the two railroading mistakes people make is railroading players into a campaign that they didn't want or weren't expecting and then the other one is to is forcing them to have only one solution to whatever problems put in front of them right if, if they feel that the only solution is the one the gm wants them to take they can get angry and, and upset right. and you know you can finesse that sometimes so that they think it's their idea but it really isn't you've, you've laid the groundwork and snuck it up on them but generally speaking you want to have multiple approaches and and will have multiple of options and, the, and so those are those are the two things that i see that GMs will make those mistakes GMs make that get players really angry and upset about railroading or those two issues. I think to do a fire ass adventure though, you have to do the prep and and the creation that without just knowing up front that, you know, when people play this, they're really only going to play about 25% of the shit that we put in this book, right. just based on the path they take right. to, to go. But, Are you kidding I mean, me? I have, all of Pirates of Drainax. I started running that over a year ago. Yep. Yeah. Once a week, every Thursday, for three fucking hours. And you know what? They have done one thing out of those books. And everything right. else has been their fucked up, messed up shit that I have to come up with on the fucking fly every goddamn <laughs> Thursday. Yeah. Yes. I don't know well, if it's uh, good or bad, but I'm having fun still. But that's right. what happens when well, you don't yeah, have some agency. <laughs> tables, yeah, tables can be uh, dice tables can be made and stuff to kind of keep keep it going. I mean, you know, you, you obviously I, can't write an encyclopedia, right? I try, I try to end a session by saying, so where do you guys think you're headed next? You know, yeah. So I can do a little bit of prep work. Doesn't knowing matter. which planet you plan on going to, you know, well, uh, that's fair. and there is, there is a huge benefit to running games in person versus online. Like what we're playing here. And, and when I say that is that, so in person, you can randomize those tables and keep playing. And there's literally no need to do any additional prep. If you've got a vinyl, uh, you know, gridded uh, sheet that is down on your table, you can just pull out a wet erase marker and draw a map. That's not a big deal. It's not so simple when you're doing games via uh, virtual tabletop because, yeah, you you kind of can draw a map, but <clears throat> it ain't great. And uh, so the the game they master get theater of the mind, Chris. Right. I it, up on the maps. You, yes, you, you've you got to... But you That's still have to come is. up with something uh, for the players to see because they're expect, or expecting some kind of visual medium. And so um, there is a, a lot more prep work that goes into VTT games than there is into traditional tabletop games. And, uh, I mean, I, I've got my one my one Sunday a month game that I run and I, I cherish it because there's like almost no prep work compared to what I do weekly for, for either of these games. And I usually try to attempt to at least, you know, think ahead, but um, that's going to become more and more difficult, <laughs> especially this campaign in particular, because um, you're about to get out into a um, a freewheeling situation. Uh, it, I don't know. Well, I guess I'll find out. I, I haven't tried it this way before, so we'll see. But anyways, uh, welcome I, I to you. No, go ahead. Where we, oh, I'm saying I don't care where we go. I'm just going to have this big cloning experiment going on. And, and, you know. Well, one of the things that they did with Deep Night is that um, they – they made it in such a way that it doesn't really matter necessarily because when you look at when you look at like travelermap.com they don't even show what the worlds are they just show an asterisk showing that there's something there but nobody knows what it is great so you can make up whatever you want you can make up whatever you want and that's kind of how deep night is set up it's like oh well here's a planet just drop it wherever or here's a situation just drop it wherever and yes, there is an overall storyline that's going on, and there are major events, but they're not really tied to any particular dot on the map, it, which is kind of nice <clears throat> compared to running, like, say, Pirates of Drenax or, um, you know, Secrets of the Ancients, 
where you're dealing with known areas and specifically known worlds that people have been playing this game for a long time are like, well, no, that's not the way it happened because that's not how that planet is. You can't really change anything. But, yeah, I told uh, well, I was changing stuff right off the bat. I said, if you think this is going to be everything you think you know about the Reach, you're wrong. Right. You guys, I, I did that after about a few months of playing with them because they go so off the rails. Right. I do the craziest stuff that I just said, well, and they said, well, there's no prison prison on this planet. I'm like, there is now. Well, how would you know? <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was pretty liberating to me was realizing how different uh, Traveler Map was from just actual stuff they've got. There was a world that I was prepping a run for, and I had all this background information about the planet from various uh, Mongoose uh, publications, you know, about stuff going on on the planet. And so then I get to Traveler Map, and I pull up the map of the planet, and it's like the surface temperature is 427 degrees and you're going, well, okay, none of the, that does just doesn't jive with whatever, what Mongoose already had. So clearly this is not canon. Well, and so I don't have to worry about it. (laughs) So with Traveler Map, when you, when you go to generate a map, it's not actually generated by Traveler Map. It goes to another site. Um, And all of their stuff, they are pulling from Traveler 5. And, and tra- don't get me wrong, Traveler 5, uh, well, I'm just going to come out and say it. Traveler 5 is a horrible, horrible role-playing game. But it is a fantastic toolbox. The flip side of that is that I am not sure what kind of crack that website's developers is smoking. Because there are some of these worlds and some of the orbit patterns that they set up for some of these worlds that is completely ridiculous. I mean, it is it literally impossible. They have garden worlds that are literally 0.2 AU from the star. And nice. the, I, I've seen, I mean, you guys have seen, uh, I commented on some of the maps that I've brought up. I'm like, this is, this is absurd. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And you run into that consistently with, with those links. So, you know, and and there's people, there are people on on the on the uh, Facebook group. Oh well, you know you can change that. Well, if you change it, then it's not the canon of the world. This is supposed to be what the world is. If I change it, then I'm changing it to whatever my traveler universe is. And if I wanted to do that, I'd have just rolled the fucking planet to begin with. I'd have just created it from scratch. You know, and so. Um, I find I find those world links they're they're useful when you need a, an image, but um, take everything you see off of there with a grain of salt. Yeah, here we go. It's the planet Tanith in uh, the Trojan Reach, and so that's it's described repeatedly as a habitable planet. And then you go, okay, the base world temperature is negative 132 degrees Celsius. <laughs> average that's a daytime garden world. Te- <laughs> average daytime temperature 432 degrees Celsius. So you're sitting there going, well, uh, I don't, you got to have some pretty special protection to make it on a planet right. with average temperature of 432 degrees. All, all, the know. plant life regrows overnight and then freezes. Yeah. And then in the morning it burns to death. <laughs> well, I mean, hypothetically, it could be that the planet's like, you know, like the moon where it doesn't rotate, you know. Yeah, it could be, it could be type totally thing. locked. Because it, it does look like it might be tidally locked and that there's only, then there's a green belt where people can live. But it just, it's not, yeah, it just doesn't match any of the documentation that's in Mongoose's publications. Well, there's some stuff and, on there that doesn't match any of the documentation, even from Classic Traveler. I, I've, I've looked yeah. at some of it and I'm like, this, this is not at all what anybody well, would know about these worlds. I, I got at a situation though where I was setting up a bunch of stuff on Tanith, and then I, uh, the night of the plane, I'm like, well, let me, I'll pull down the world map and I'll put it up. And I pull down the world map, I look at it, and I'm like, well, this doesn't match anything right. that I was reading right. from all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, eh. so at that point, I realized, fuck it, I can do what I want. You know, that's like, yes, <laughs> you know? yes, that is true. Yeah. Anyway, do what you want. Yes, do what you want. <laughs> it is your traveler universe. Welcome to Deep Night Revelation. We'll be picking up where we left off last week. Last week, uh, when we ended, they, the uh, Dr. Bocephus um, had a shocking, uh, somewhat shocking revelation that 
um, clear back as far as the second imperium they had technology for copying not only uh, people's memories but their entire personality onto a wafer and unfortunately this killed the subject but they continued to live on on this wafer and then this wafer could be slotted into somebody with a wafer jack thus allowing this person to take or this personality on the wafer to take over this person's body and basically walk them around like a fleshy battle mech and uh yeah. and do yeah. things for like a week and then it it was supposed to shut off and and uh and then the wafer is supposed to be pulled and put back into a special storage unit their special wafers and uh so that was the big revelation from uh last week uh, but this week, <clears throat> they are continuing on their journey after they also discovered uh, the um, carcass of a leviathan and uh, and uh, did a little bit of study on that, uh, a space-born space whale. Um, it lives in space. And, With uh, Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, they are continuing on their journey. Um, but before we get started, we'd like to thank one of the friends of the Greenwater Guild Hall. None of these are sponsorships or partnerships of any kind. They're just products that we really like. And uh, today we would like to thank uh, the Speechless Bard. Speechless Bard makes leather products for your tabletop role-playing games, such as leather covers for your core rule, uh, rule books. She has a full line of dice bracelets. Uh, this this particular month in particular, she... Um, she does a pride bracelet where the dice shapes on the leather bracelet are all done in uh, various colors. Um, very popular item. <clears throat> um, she has this really cool thing called the Spell Compendium that's a um, combination, it's a bifurcated dice box. One side is empty, so you could use it as a dice roller. The other side is um, can be used to hold a deck of cards, for instance. And on the inside, on the inside cover, cover. Um, it <laughs> has a magnetic spell slot tracker. Um, it's a very cool item. Um, if you are going to order, um, either for yourself or if, especially if it's a gift idea or something like that, make sure you give yourself a little bit of extra time. She's over in the UK. And with all of the supply chain uh, issues, um, although I haven't experienced as much of that recently, but with supply chain issues, it can take a little while to cross the pond. And um, evidently the US government thinks that leather is explosive, so it'll sit in customs for God knows how long. They don't understand how cows work. But um, if you are a fan of the channel or you like our games, you like our shows, uh, we do have a merch store. Um, the it, I, I actually have just completed that, um, that logo that, Wes, you gave me. I have cleaned it up and made it functional. And so there may be a uh, Deep Night uh, Special Operations t-shirt coming out. Um, soon, hopefully. Um, but we've got T-shirts and we got buttons. <clears throat> One of the T-shirts is the pirate flag from our Wednesday night Pirates Drenax campaign. Um, there is <clears throat> the uh, the Brawnhaven campaign book cover T-shirt. There we have a blanket that comes in three sizes, uh, going from small baby blanket size all the way up to giganto size. Uh, that is a map of the Brawnhaven region. Um, we got all sorts of stuff. There's even a there's even a beer stein on there. So go get yourself a new T-shirt. Help support the channel, and we appreciate it. If you are you secretly put trap portals throughout the real world, and you <laughs> end up in Brawnhaven, motherfucker. And if you don't have a map. Don't blame us. Yeah, well, you know, if you find one of those uh, trapdoors, can you can you send me its location? Because I am looking to move. <laughs> but <laughs> that sounds that Broadhaven sounds a lot better than here. I don't know, man. We're in that fucking vampire crypt. Yeah, well, yeah, there is that. Um, speaking of Broadhaven, there is if you are new to the Broadhaven campaign setting, I just released a book bundle. Uh, via for PDF on both Drive Through RPG and Big Geek Emporium, um, it includes the Broadhaven campaign setting, the thing in the basement, the light in the church, the nobleman's manor, and the ruin, the ruins of Castle Brawn, all in one bundle, um, and it saves you a little bit of scratch uh, versus buying each of those books uh, separately. 
So go check that out. And uh, coming soon will be the Lost Mines of Drothamstone, the next adventure in the campaign setting. All right. <clears throat> so, um, so yes, Bocephus, you have you've got this uh, very peculiar information, and uh, and it has, <clears throat> I mean. These details aren't the details that that the captain gave you aren't just um, like um, you know detailed reports. It actually goes into um, how to make you know how basically how to make one of these things. It, it is schematics on what needs to go into this, and essentially the the wafer itself. And anybody, I don't know, um, JT, you might know about this. So back in Back in the late 90s, um, there were some experiments done. They may actually still be going on. I'm not sure. Uh, but there were experiments that were done um, where they took uh, cells from brain tumors and attempted to put them on uh, memory boards and PCB, or, or on chips and PCBs and attempting to use uh, these cells. And it was viable. They actually functioned uh as ram quite well and uh or at least temporarily they functioned um I, like i said I, this was in the mid to late 90s and so uh this is very similar where it it is a mix this wafer that is used to hold the memories and personality is a mix of biological and technical um technology and so it is um I mean, step one, of course, would be to um, grow the the uh, brain cells that would be needed to to attach to this um, chip and whatnot. But it goes into the entire process. Like the document said, <clears throat> ultimately the subject is killed in the process. Uh, but if if I mean, do we do they have to go for just a week? Can 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 you just like plug somebody in and just let them go forever and they'll be okay they can just live their life out so no um they found in their they found in their research or in their in their experiences that the process it wasn't even so much that the the chip itself or the wafer itself was limited to a week it's that um two things happen one the the consciousness of the person that this personality is taking over would re-exert itself and basically reject the the wafer personality the second part of it is that the the wafer would start to degrade after a week okay so and it does, for it to it, be viable, we would need uh, a better medium to to transfer the memory with, and and um, maybe well theoretically. But you're talking about the, this report that you're reading, and I mean it. It is fairly complicated. You're talking about tech level fifteen uh, with some uh, prototype sixteen stuff mixed in. And so, um, I mean, talking about needing a, a better medium, you're talking about a higher tech level, essentially, or deeper into tech level 16, at the least. But, um, yeah, essentially, you would need a better medium. But ultimately, the, the person that is being taken over by this wafer, I mean, they can't coexist at the same time. There is a report that... Um, it, it is unsubstantiated, but there is a report where there was a um, malfunction that the that the wafer personality, the agent, as they refer to them, did not cease uh, to operate after a week. And it is uh, speculated that they may have continued to live in <clears throat> in their host for years. Well, what if the host was a clone 
that uh, just got to adult size in two weeks. It really wouldn't have any any memories or anything upon awakening. I mean, I mean, you're you're essentially talking about. Um, I mean, that technology already exists. I mean, they yeah they the uh, <laughs> general development well, got company. The... It's a closely guarded secret by general development. Well, we've got a cloning vat. I mean, that can make adults in two weeks. Right. So, I mean, it wouldn't have any memories or nothing. If we could, if we could just take the clone and and put some, you know, some cybernetic on it, pre-prep it up to be prime condition and prime cyborged out, and then just stick that wafer jack. Maybe if we could reprogram the agent to be less of an agent that stays on the wafer jack and make it more of like a virus where it wants to go in and take over the brain and and really do something like that. So essentially, uh, so like I said, Jadeco, um closely guards that their, their cloning technology. Um, it is, um, but like, it, it as far as I almost slipped. So it is. It as far as as you guys are aware. I mean, you guys are all aware that um, general development company is pretty ubiquitous uh, back in the reach, and uh, um, it is widely believed um, that <clears throat> their elite operatives are all are all clones. They are pre-programmed death machines um you know they they come out of the vat after two years fully a good adult and fully trained and they know kung fu so but but you don't you wouldn't have access to that um that is closely guarded corporate secret and um you you're not in the imperium but technically you are a imperial ship with a couple of caveats and addendums being corporate owned. Um, but in the Imperium, laws on cloning are um, nebulous and vague, but it's frowned upon. Almost like anagathics are frowned upon. I don't know why they don't want people living forever, but... I've got my argument already kind of done up for that. I'm going to uh, put Sardo on the spot and make him defend it um, is kind of kind of my game plan there. If you have advocate, you don't have yeah. to agree with the opinion. You just have to argue it. <laughs> that's, yeah, see, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm going for. And the need for us to be able to go on an extensive, you know, what I'm trying to do here is, is create a pathway where if our characters or, or other important NPCs die, uh, we can replace them or uh, clone shock troops that can uh, go do our bidding in remote locations and, you know, we can give them red shirts and everything. Right. And this, that was your selling point to the captain of deep night. And uh, that's why he gave you the dossier that he gave you um, because he, it is quickly becoming um, apparent to him as you are getting closer and closer to actually reaching Point Denman and leaving charted space, <clears throat> the reality is that, you know, up until now, let's say that you let's say that somebody crashed a launch and four crew member, vital crew members were killed. Well, one, not only are you down a launch, which is difficult to, re impossible to replace after you leave charted space, but those four crew members are impossible to replace. And so before, uh, and uh, you know, now, currently, because you're in charted space, it's not impossible. You could buy another launch. You could theoretically um, stay a couple of extra days and, and recruit, you know, four replacements. You know, even if it's just people with a pulse, you could recruit them to your ship to, to fill it with warm bodies and move on. After Point Denman, that is no longer an option. You cannot rebuild. You cannot. There's nobody to hire. There's no place to buy another launch. And building an entire spacecraft is 
a complicated affair. So, um, I'm looking that, forward to playing a funky alien if I die. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny that you say that because there are some funky aliens uh, coming up. Um, and so, so he looked at that and he could see as much as it rubbed against all of his moral instincts, he could see the value in it. And so that's why he agreed to give you this dossier that is, you know, code black, top secret, nobody is to know about this. Um, and there are reports in this, in the, or there are, um, there is information in these reports of some really um, questionably heinous shit that these, that these wafer agents did on the behalf of the Empire. Now, of course, reading through the reports, you have that third that third person view where you can see why these decisions were made. But I'm talking about situations where, oh, well, a plague broke out on this planet. Okay, well, then just sterilize the entire planet, kill every living thing on the planet, and then quarantine it for the next 30 years. And then we'll send a science ship to to spend another 15 years studying the plant to make sure that whatever this plague was is dead, there's no survivors, etc. Then we can maybe discuss recolonization efforts. I mean, genocide on a planetary scale is, I mean, there are pages and pages and pages of this going on. And it, it like I said, it goes all the way from uh, about mid mid second imperium, all the way up to um, to third imperium, I'm, and I'm trying to remember her name. Alab Alabatra hmm. Empress Alabatra Traka, or uh, I forget how to say her name. Anyways, um, genocide. I cannot hear you. You can't hear me? No, I can't hear uh, Randolph. Oh. So anyways, what were you saying? Oh, are, are we as a crew against genocide? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, okay. I would think you know. Uh, I'm just, I'm, you know, it's good to know these things Unless before it... you know we get put in this situation. And... Yeah, I oh. mean, it, it really, it really, um, it, it really, I guess, depends on your view. Um, let's see here. Oh, as a yeah, I'm player, not... I'm cool either way. We can, we can really. We can go evil. We can be lawful good. We can. I, I'm cool. Hey, Glenn. If you go into Skype and go to your settings, you might check uh, audio and make sure because I know mine does this every once in a while. Um, if you scroll down and look at your microphone, make sure it's set to your headset mic. It depends on the degree of sapience, right? I mean, I, I'm not gonna get upset that you wiped out an entire species of microbe that is, you know, deadly, you know, or, or if those were the last of the space leeches that can destroy our ship, I'm not going to sweat it, but yeah, intelligent life forms. Right. Right. Problematic. If, if it was pixies, you're going to complain about it. Yeah. Probably try it's, to have me arrested. It, it, it comes down to sapience. Right. So with this, uh, I don't know. So, Bocephus, uh, are you keeping, this is the question, are you keeping this um, top secret info to yourself, or are you sharing that with the rest of your command crew? Um, missions, mission command crew. You know, I'm going to look, I mean, the rest of the, you know, the rest of the command crew, I'm going to let them know what I'm looking into and studying. I, I'm not going to hide it from them. Uh, if if they want to eject, you know, uh, then you know the we can have the conversation and 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 see how that wants. But you know, I'm I'm right now. I'm just researching, so it's it's no harm, no foul. It's 
knowing something is not immoral. Well, I guess my question, are you going to show, you know, Randolph, uh, Jack, George, and Sarda, are you going to show them this, this dossier that was given to you? You know, I will. I'll share it with them because I think uh, group collaborations, uh, even if if the sciences in the in the path there might not be the other uh, other other uh, forte. So you will get an email with this PDF marked top secret. In your, in your no, I don't do it like that. <laughs> like you know, we're just. We have our little briefings, I'm sure, from time to time. And just one time I'll be like, you know, hey, uh, I'm trying to look for for viable uh, solutions to, you know, what we're going to do if people die and and, and how we're going to do it, you know, and and I'll show them the information. Right. uh, You know. It's it's a good history lesson for everybody, you know. I mean, hell, it, it might just knowing this shit might raise your education one. Oh. Well, so I have a chip jack. And so normally when you use something like that, I would imagine you're accessing the information on that chip. It's not taking over your brain. You're not, you know, so trapped the, by it. So, so these wafer jacks do require a neural jack, not just a standard wafer jack. Um, and it does. It takes over all motor reflexes, everything. Okay. You 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 essentially become whoever is on that wafer. I'm at this point very thankful I only have a chip jack. <laughs> yes. Oh, but I mean we can upgrade it for you at any time. No, you couldn't. You have to replace it. Yeah, I mean, you it's would... a significant change. Yeah. Yes. Right. I, I but you know, the end result is an upgrade. <laughs> you know? It's like when you upgrade your car. You get a new car, you know. So, um, I mean, electric vehicle. They're yeah. incredibly expensive, so I don't imagine we can just fabricate them on our own. Yeah, you know no, I mean? I mean, and and yeah, this would be something. Uh, I mean, again, this it, it, not that you couldn't fabricate it on your own, but you're talking about <clears throat> weeks and months of of research and development in order to make one that's functional. Um, it wouldn't be as simple as just, oh, well, we'll just upgrade it. No. Yeah. Well, we can, we can, uh, we can synthesize, uh, uh, anything TL 13 or less electronics type wise. We can, I mean, yeah, we can do that with the refabrication, uh, stuff and, and, and it's TL 15. Yeah. Augmentations though. I mean, you're, well, I mean, you're used to doing stuff that is going to be, you know, a, a neural a wafer jacks and things of that nature. These are augmentations that are basically off the shelf, out of box. A neural jack is 13 plus, and it's something that jacks in directly to the nervous system. Yeah. It it's going to be a little bit, um, a little bit more than that. So. <clears throat> I mean, oh, yeah, you could it, come close if you were to just fiddle, fiddle fuck around with it, and mix a neural link with a neural jack because that's essentially all it is. But you're used to you open up the box and you open the bubble wrap. And oh, it's ready uh, to well, install. I need the engineers, you know, and and they need to, you know, the, the engineering people need to help on that. Maybe somebody with robotics. Chris, I think you're forgetting. He he doesn't open the box. He cracks the skull open and removes <laughs> yes. it from someone else. Yes, yes. He, he borrow, borrows it from somebody else. Oh. <laughs> Look, these things should be recycled. You know, whenever possible. It's yeah. better for the environment. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, so yeah, you guys are in jump. Uh, I mean, essentially for for several weeks you know coming out for three four days at a time to refuel and it it, it is becoming tedium um during this this month uh that you guys are in travel um you know i would assume Bocephus is going over uh trying to learn new things about this and doing his research what is sarda and uh, what is sarda doing 
Well, I wanted to pion- pioneer the project where everybody spends like one day out of ten, or right. you know, right. doing something completely different than their normal assignment, cross training people, and uh, I- I'm actually a volunteer to work in the kitchen if they uh, have such a facility. I mean, it's, it may be more maintenance style work. Uh, I don't know if they just use have machines just you know like soft serve machines that <laughs> yes you know, if that's how food's prepared that's fine but i mean you know if, if that's the case i'll probably do more like maintenance work but i was thinking something more along the lines of uh of you know service industry uh uh i've got that steward skill so maybe focus on that you know cross train that way so that i'm getting to know other people in different areas so thanks to uh especially your last stop or your last major stop in charted space on arcturus um so yeah you're used to um the food here is a lot better than what you're used to i mean you're used to essentially it's um a reconstituted protein paste with a flavor packet akin to what you would get in a package of top ramen soup that you can then um, variously make into uh, you know multiple flavors so there's a there's a paste spigot and then and then a vending machine that dispenses the flavor packets right but you right. guys <laughs> you guys right yeah essentially but essentially you guys are eating better than what you're normally used to because you've got access to fresh food you've got as- access to fresh meat and so uh yeah, you're you're doing pretty good. Go ahead and make a uh let's see, that would be I guess a steward plus intellect check. <coughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Now we can, yes. Uh but yeah, we were trying to come up with a way to keep people from getting into little clicks. Yeah. And also to prevent boredom. Yeah. And so the cr- cross training thing was uh an effort to do that. That sounds like a wonderful idea that, you you know, people do that. Yeah, cross-training, man. Yeah. Boxcars, of course. Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay, so, yeah, you, um... On here, I'm looking for something specific. There we go. That's right, we, that's right, we got food from the those big dudes. Yeah. I'm, I'm running the meat. I'm run, I've been running the meat carving station. Yes, you basically. <laughs> so you've come up with basically like a Brazilian grill kind of situation, and uh, uh, you have successfully. I don't. I don't like this, but whatever. Yeah, you increase. Uh, just from the food alone um, and this idea, um, you have increased uh, crew morale by eight. People are much uh, much happier with decent food and uh, and they're they're getting out of their um, their mundane uh, Monday through Friday kind of situation and one of the <clears throat> one of the people that is a part of your your uh, kitchen duty is uh, this gentleman David the wizard no uh, Mayak Estava, Estavi um, who he um, <clears throat> he's he is he was hired as a deckhand um, and overall, uh, so far, he has <laughs> not really proven to be guy, all that guy's incredibly, uh, incredibly unqualified. Yes, he, <laughs> that is exactly it. He is incredibly unqualified at almost everything. Um, and, and you can ignore the pilot small craft. Um, he has not, sure. he has not revealed that to anybody. Um, but and he doesn't really talk a whole lot about his about his past or why he he joined up. Um, but um, he just doesn't seem like he's very skilled at anything in particular. He's um, uh, just that's part of deception too. He sounds right. perfect for away missions. Yeah, he's he's 
he's get just, that guy a red shirt. Um, yeah, they, get that guy a red shirt. So, like I said, he was originally hired as a deckhand, um, but he is um, kind of present. He's not very good at being a deckhand, but he has presented that he is um, uh, creative in other in other ways, and um, all of his superiors um, have noted that you know he's not good at really anything but he is a really hard worker and and he's kind of on your your kitchen duty and uh so you you end up meeting uh Mayak Astavi um and right now he is listed uh, he has been listed as a research assistant um simply because the uh the engineering section didn't and, and even the cargo department didn't really want him as a uh, deckhand because A, he's clumsy, and B, he has no idea what he's doing. And so he has been assigned to the mission division as a, mm -hmm. um, a research assistant. And so he is, he kind of signed up for, for this. And, uh, you know, he, he tells you while you're on, on the kitchen line that uh, he's like, well, I don't know much about a whole lot of things, but I know how to cook. And... He's not entirely wrong. He he uh he assists you a bit. I mean, he's he's not going to uh he he certainly wouldn't be able to pull it off on his own the way you did, but he is of assistance to you. And he's Great. a hard okay. worker. George so, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, sorry. I, I mean, I I'm I'm kind of curious how he ended up getting hired on. And so I would ask about so he he was actually he had applied and uh to deep night um uh, exploration for the mission specifically um and at first he says he didn't think that he was going to get the job but uh he found out that he was a last miss minute replacement for another crew member who had dropped out and uh like he said, he he said I was hired as a deckhand, but come to find out, I'm not really that good at it. And he said he he admits to you openly. He says I might have exaggerated a bit on my resume. Sure, <laughs> Every, sure, everybody does. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, from from some of the reports <laughs> that Sarda's seeing, it seems like he really embellished a lot. Um. I mean, maybe we're past the point of embellishment into complete fabrication. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he, he just says, you know, I, I signed up. I wanted, I wanted to do something that sounded like it mattered. And, um, and let me, when I say that, he says, I wanted to do something that mattered. Oh, I need that. All right. Of the deck six, do we? Yeah, I well, and I'll ask I if, if there's. I... I'll, I'll ask if there's anything specifically that he'd like to get better at. Um, I mean, obviously cooking, but I mean, is there you know? Because I mean, he definitely could use training in something. Yeah, he. Uh, well, he he says, um, you know. You know, he answers honestly. He says that uh, um, he 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 says he would really like to kind of um, learn a bit more about engineering. And right. you, you can roll a recon plus intellect check. <clears throat> this will be the one I just totally beef. <clears throat> I'm sorry, close my character sheet. Oh, no worries. Unfortunately, I lost my character sheet. Oh, no. I'm having to. I'm having to. <laughs> I lost my hard drive yesterday. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, so I got. I only got. I only got. Let's upgrade the PC with a new new CPU and graphics card, and it boots up and goes. What? What hard drive? <laughs> Glenn, just right. get yourself a Google account, like a Google account, and just use the Google Drive to store stuff. That way, it doesn't matter what PC you're on. You yeah, I do. Have. I do that with OneDrive uh, for most of my writing because I never know where I'm going to be with my tablet, and so it's just easier to save it to OneDrive. I only got a six, so I probably didn't. So yeah, you don't. You don't really. 
Um, he's everything that he says sounds um, reasonable. He he wants to learn more about engineering. All right. Well, I'll see if we can't during this cross training thing put him into an engineering rotation. Okay. Okay. So during this month or so, George, what are you what are you doing? Oh, George is going to focus on um, on his gun combat. That's not a bad idea. So you're you going know, down to the range. Making sure everything's good. I mean, it's what I it's what I'm good at, right? Like maybe focus on just like unarmed combat and gun combat. I'm I'm going to stay in shape. I'm going to work out. You know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Keep focused. Maybe read some Nietzsche's. And some Mad Magazine to compensate. You know, you know yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I would say that, so over here in the aft pods, uh, where is one? Wow, that is, oh, two. So over here in the aft pods, there is number two here. These are considered gaming spaces, and they would have all manner of, like, um, <clears throat> There's no need to expend real ammunition. They have full uh, VR setups where you can practice your 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 uh, gunmanship, and um, it mimics everything. The kick of the gun, uh, everything is is mimicked, and you can practice in there. And so you're you're <laughs> you're reading and uh, and uh, and spending, you know much of your time down here and probably eating some of Sarda's uh, delicious Brazilian grill in the, uh, in the mess. That sound about right. Sounds good. Okay. And then, you know, I'm always up for a good meal in a gunfight. So, and well, considering guess... my last good meal ended up in a gunfight, I didn't even get to eat. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So it blew up my taco stand. That's true. So evidently, and this is weird looking, but evidently it says five here is an armory. Like maybe it's in the hallway. <laughs> they just they just have the gun lockers on the wall here, and the I don't know. That's well, that makes sense. As you're running through, you can grab weapons. Yeah, you can just grab headed. something, right? So I mean, there there are a number of uh, I mean there are a number of uh, stations that have you know a revolver or something like or a shotgun in them uh, for security purposes, um, things of that nature. But yeah, so you are spending your month uh, practicing your gun combat. So Jack, uh, you and Randolph, and Randolph was actually a. Um, so Randolph, you did get a invite to this um, to this Imperials um, weekly poker game. Finally, but finally. but they but it was it was several weeks after Jack got his invite, and it was kind of a um, the feeling that you get uh, when you go to this poker game is that it was kind of a they didn't they they felt bad for leaving you out but you can go ahead and make a recon plus intellect check randolph let's see if i can remember what that was uh, it doesn't hurt to update everything in roll 20 that, then it's that's yeah. there because i don't have a physical copy i don't have a copy of my own character sheet at all it's everything's in roll 20 yeah, there's a couple of things about the Roll20 sheet I wish they would update to the newest Mongoose sheet because that sheet's pretty fantastic. But The alternate overall, stats are really nice. Yeah, the alternate, Again, having eight. the alternate stats is really nice. Okay, so with an 8, <clears throat> you, you kind of, you walk in, you don't really, I mean, you know um, Sub-Lieutenant Alex Venati. Um, I, I guess you wouldn't know her personally we wouldn't know her. no i wouldn't know her personally <laughs> right no but but i mean you you have you have met her and uh and but everybody else that's in this in in the um in this uh this 
basically it's just a uh, common area. What is this? There we go. So it's in one of these common areas, uh, state rooms, and um, everybody seems to. The feeling that you get is that everybody seems th that is there is, was Navy or Marines. Um, there are a couple of people that were um, Army, um, but they all were either actively serving and got transferred for one reason or the other to Deep Night Revelation, or they mustered out and immediately joined Deep Night Revelation. Unlike you, who mustered out and joined the Scout Service. And so there seems to be almost not an animosity but a little bit of a cold shoulder towards you because of that not too surprising um and and it's Vers versus me that got court-martialed out of the military and uh right went merchant, is, mer mer went merchant marine right which you know that's why you weren't invited at all <laughs> they, <laughs> they have their standards but uh so you you and jack but i'm still i'm still on the reserves well, yeah, that, that, that counts. Well, it, it does count, which is why you're you were finally invited. They kind of weighed, you know, the scales and said, "Well, okay." Um, and and so, if I ever come back in fifteen years, I might get you called. <laughs> yes, yeah. If, I, if I'm back in fifteen to to twenty years, you know. So you and Jack walk into this uh, into this uh, essentially. Um, these are bunks, essentially. And, uh, you know, they they have busted out uh, a really expensive bottle of uh, scotch. Volani hey. scotch. Um, well, they got two bottles. They got a, a bottle of Volani and a bottle of Soleimani scotch. And they are going to, their idea is that they are going to play cards and, you know, shoot the shit and... Mm -hmm. Try these two to see which one, you know, they are going to decide here and now which which the Volani or the Soleimani makes a better scotch. That That's their plan. Need to throw some Bocephus gin into the mix. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> wonderful in liquors that'll make you go blind. <laughs> no, it's it'll make you feel good, then it's going to make you feel bad, but that's okay, <laughs> he's got something to make you feel good again. Right. If yeah, if you drink my strange love, love juice, I guarantee you won't get bored. <laughs> Meanwhile, in George's quarters, all of the the service panels are pulled off the walls, and all the wiring is missing. <laughs> but um, so yeah, you guys you guys come into this uh, into this quarters, and uh, they all they all kind of are like Jack, you know, join us. Oh, Randolph, come on in, and uh, they are. They are pouring red solo cups with two fingers of this scotch, asking you which one you would prefer. Yes, the red solo cup has survived into the future of travel. That's what I was wondering. The, yes. red, the red solo Dixie cup is still around. Oh yes. Oh yes. I want. I want one to give me more of. You. You want what? I want the one. I want the one where you give me a bigger, bigger slug of. <laughs> so they they pour you one of each, and and uh, <laughs> Sir Alex Venati comes up and hands basically your two fists. She goes, "Well, Randolph, tell us which one you think is better." <laughs> well, let me smell. <laughs> Switch it around the back of the tongue. <laughs> Just like a good wine. I like that one. <laughs> Left fist. <laughs> good. And so, so Randolph, and I, I know you don't have your character sheet. Do you remember if you have carouse? Zero. Go ahead and make a carouse plus intellect check. Okay, so you are able to tell the difference between these two. Um, the the Volani Scotch, 
So I, I, I guess, I guess using real world um, experience. How many of you have tried the Japanese scotch? Like, um, check it. It's pretty good. It is pretty good, but there is a there is a difference in flavor. How can they pay a Japanese scotch? There's no there's yeah, no it, it's Scottish not, malt in it. Ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> but where's the peat? The Scottish peat. <laughs> there, there is there is a difference. I found that the Japanese versions, there is a a sharpness, almost metallic, to it that you don't get with with true scotch. That's my opinion. Um, I have a friend who absolutely loves it, um, but that is my opinion. Um, it, this is very similar. The Volani Scotch has a sharpness to it. The Solomani, uh, which actually came from the Scottish Highlands, is smooth, heaty, smoky, and the good shit. I like that. <laughs> And and Vinod, uh, Sir, Sub Lieutenant Venati kind of claps you on the back, and she says, "Ah, you're not a true Volani, then." <laughs> just, and she yells around the room. She's like, hey, "We got a Solomani sympathizer over here." <laughs> uh, she, they invite Jack. Uh, they're like, "Come, sit down. We'll deal you in." All right. So. So, Jack, do you have carouse or gamble? At zero. Yeah. Go ahead. I have carouse. You can go ahead and make a carouse plus intellect check. That's actually pretty good. So, yeah, you're playing. You're playing cards. You're not. Nef you're. You're definitely not uh, winning. You've come close a couple of times, but um, really, nobody at the table is really taking the cards too seriously. Um, but. In in your crowd, you definitely pass your crowd check. So you you're drinking scotch, and um, being a marine, you probably don't really care. You're just like, hey, it's got liquor in it. I'm off duty. Give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Is it rubbing alcohol? Give it to free. Me. Yeah, it's free. free. It's free. That's <laughs> that's the best kind of booze. And so, um, <laughs> the, one of the things that you learn is that there is, uh, well, and I mean obviously. You learn a couple of things. The first being that there seems to be a growing camaraderie of imperial loyalists um, that that is growing on the ship, and they they if you are a part of the group that is in this room right now playing cards and drinking scotch, these people would essentially do anything for you, and. They they tell you, uh, Jack, that they were, they they admit, um, well, Venati admits, she says, that they, there was some discussion and uh, not a lot of consensus on whether to invite you at all, or you or Randolph. Randolph, for obvious reasons, because he, he was a member of the Scout Service, but he is a member of the Reserve, so that played in his, in his hand. But... The other reason being that you are rank of commanders and you are management. And they didn't necessarily, I mean, they want this to be um, free of rank. It's their Blue Lives Matter club. Aren't right. they all officers? Not all of them are officers. In fact, you have oh. you. So Venati is a sub lieutenant. You've got a guy that is uh, sitting there, you know, telling jokes with Randolph and and uh, chiding him about his Soleimani connection. And that guy's that guy's an able space hand. I mean, there 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 is all manner of rank in here. And but you, it's like as soon as you open the door, it seems like all all uh decorum as far as rank goes is they're all they're all good buddies are there any chief petty officers there are we need to make friends with him we need to we need to get him as an information source and so they venati kind of explains uh that 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 was the the big concern is that in here Rank isn't an issue. We're all we're all Imperials first, and we've got each other's back. We are 
we are a unit, we are a family. Was kind Sarda, of. Is she the leader Sarda of the was, group? Sarda was a petty, petty officer. So, yeah, well. Or at least the most influential member. More, more, more or less. Yeah, that's a that's a, a pretty good, um, that's a pretty good description. Is that she is kind of, um, she's kind of the one who got this all this ball rolling, and you you've already witnessed that she's capable of this kind of thing. Um, with that little minor insurrection mm -hmm. that she tried to pull. Um, minor mutiny. Minor mutiny. She tried to. When was that? So, she uh, back when oh. one of the crew was arrested on uh, on the planet with the stupid laws. Um, she rather than go through diplomatic routes, she uh, had br her and a number of crew had broken into the armory, and were going to try and do a special missions op to break her out and. Uh, they, you guys they were going to try to. They're going to try to steal a shuttle and then go down to the planet and then somehow break into a high security prison, and then try to break somebody out of the high security prison, yes. return to the shuttle, and fly back. Yes, that was their plan. I mean, yeah, it was but, the most rid ridiculous plan ever. Yes, and they essentially committed mutiny to do this. Yes, the the planet that <clears throat> the planet that had such strict laws that you could uh, be fined for not having your toilet paper hung in your bathroom in an overhand draw yeah. fashion. That plan. Yeah, I think I missed the one with the mutiny. I was there for the one where she got arrested, I think, but I think I missed the mutiny part. Yeah. All, yeah. All, the while so I, we were, all the while we were working to get the person released through legal channels and it succeeded, you know, it was, and they just wouldn't yeah. listen to us at all. Mm. So, I mean, well, she, she and her... That's what I was kind of thinking. She and her co-conspirators. She's very ambitious. <clears throat> she. Well, um, she's the only titled person in the group. She's she, she's, she's a an, sir, so she's yeah, a noble. She, she, she was is an a noble. Appointee, and so she's got something to prove. Yeah, she. <clears throat> that that is a perfect uh, description. Um, so she, uh, yes, she is a young noble. Um, due to her great uncle's influence, she is now aboard Deep Night Revelation. Um, and on the one hand, and she she freely admits this, that she feels like her ability to prove herself has been robbed of her. Uh, because she she didn't pick to be a noble. She she didn't be she didn't pick to be knighted. That was kind of just bestowed upon her. At a very young age, and it was expected that she would go into the academy and that she would go, you know, into the Imperial Navy, which she did. And she was hoping to actually prove herself beyond beyond her knighthood. And that was stolen from her by putting her on this ship. And so now, <clears throat> and, and she freely admits she feels that she she has to work twice as hard in order to prove herself because she doesn't have the opportunities to do so. Her, she wanted to get glory through combat, quick, quick, r rapid ascension. Her uncle didn't want her in combat. That's why he stuck her on this. This. She wasn't well, part of our. Uh, she was not mind? part of this crew. Right. The how uncle. The, ins the uncle insisted we take her. He just he wanted her uh, away from combat. And yeah, keep her, but keep how did safe. she do on the mining thing? She actually did excellent on the mining thing. That that whole situation, that guy, um, who, by the way, the guy whose arm is all effed up from that, he's still in a gel cast, is Mia Estavi, who is helping Sarda. Um, I forgot that one little piece of data. But, uh, oh, so she, he's uh, under my care. Yeah, well, I mean, he's, he's out of care by now. He, he, is, he has a cast on his arm. You're going to see in six to eight weeks how the healing is going when you take the cast off and whether or not, you know, it's a lost cause or not. But so far, things look good. And uh, if it wasn't for her, he'd be dead. So she kind of she doesn't see it, but um, clearly um, she has more or less proven herself. I don't know if. It's up to you guys whether you, whether or not you need to 
uh, she needs to do more to prove herself. But um, at least in 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 Mia Kastavi's eyes, you know, she's she's a good egg. I mean, well, I mean, she successfully did the job and did it well. I mean, I would think she's fine to do other jobs in the future, and we could trust her to do well and, at it. And truth be told, the reports that Jack and Randolph that you saw, um, Mayak Estavi's injury was because he isn't very good at what he does. He, he's, he's very good at anything. He's not very good at anything. And so he's inexperienced, didn't know what he was doing. He drilled in the wrong spot and caused the mountain to collapse on him. And uh, But beyond that, the rest of the operation ran flawlessly. And it wasn't her. She didn't pick who went on the operation. That came from the bridge. So... Yeah. They it's... were trying to get rid of... Yeah. We well, they get they just looked through. They looked through the the crew that had such and such skills that were listed on their resume and said, "Okay, assign that guy." They didn't. Man, they didn't bother to check to see if these people were lying. <laughs> there was they a time. Checked to, they checked to see if he had deception and jacks of all trades. Right. Well, ain't nobody got time for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> one the, of the the deception kid. I mean, you know. Quite possibly, uh, but we he could be repurposed. I mean, a guy that can lie, uh, you know, get make make him be the 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 spokesman or something that goes around and tells people the company line. Well, we got a guy with an arm and a cast working in the kitchen, so you know he's fucking useless. Well, well yeah, <laughs> but he wasn't. He he wasn't. He was actually he actually did for once. He he did a an okay job. But one of the people sitting at the card table wash dishes. and kind of listening to to this whole thing is this young lady right here, Chandra Vleden. And um, she she joined the expedition like literally she mustered out of the Navy and a week later she had signed up for Deep Night Revelation uh, mission. Um Fairly undistinguished, uh, but honorable career as an engineering technician aboard support vessels. And so they picked her up. And currently she is working in engineering as a life support technician and is doing a fairly good job of it. <clears throat> but she she's kind of sitting there quietly, um, you know, sipping her 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 scotch and playing cards Um She might she, be good for damage control. She she damn near won a hand, and she doesn't know shit about gambling. She didn't win, but she she plays a, a, a good a good game. They're they're playing Volani Hold'em, um, which is basically Texas Hold'em, but the Volani claim that they invented it because the Volani <laughs> think they invented everything. Um, Just like Russia. Okay, right. Jet. Yes. <laughs> so does on Shakespeare. Does does Jack and Randolph have any uh, questions or or are you wanting to pump these guys for information? Not my first night. Well, since you brought her up, she must be something. So yeah, I kind of want to figure out what Chandra's deal is. So. Um, yeah, she she opens up. She says that uh, most of her career was spent on tankers. Um, she she uh, the tankers would follow the fleet around, uh, you know, sitting in a backwater system for months on end, waiting for a rendezvous. And she said, you know, to be real honest, it kind of suited me. She's like, I I wasn't. Technically, I it wasn't wartime, and I wasn't on the front lines, even you know, doing picket duty or anything like that. And she said, I, "I'll be real honest. I just kind of floated through my naval career, and it suited me. And I, I needed something to do after I I left the navy, and so I saw a recruitment ad for this, and I thought, hey." Long-range exploration, that can't be 
too much different than what I was already doing. And so here she is. All right. Good enough. Um, so this, this, uh, your weekly poker game and Sarda's, uh, kitchen duty and, uh, George, <laughs> George's <laughs> gunplay and Bocephus's, uh, you know, Dr. Krieger-esque, um, cloning <laughs> research. <laughs> it's, uh, the boys from Brazil, um, is going on, uh, for, you know, the next month and a half. And oh, I want to, yeah. before we get too far off track, I want to talk to that bald noble chick. Yeah. I want to catch her in a hallway one-on-one -on -one somewhere. Yeah. Alex Venati. What? Yeah. What, Venati. what would you, what would you I like tell her, to? I, I, I corner her and say, I, uh, you know, I have a problem with you. I think you have a little bit too much ambition for this mission. This mission, as far as I'm concerned, is a death sentence. It's 20 years. If you're looking to score points, political points, this ain't the mission for you. And if you ever go rogue again, like you did with that mutiny, I will kill you myself. Ooh. She, uh, well, uh, that's it. And my advice is to get off before we go out to space. I like a Marines. That, that might be your last <laughs> card game. <laughs> yeah. will, you, will you get a DNA sample before you kick her off the ship? Please, uh, you don't but, mind. Yeah, we'll kick her off out of the airlock. We so could, I could build her stronger. Better. I tell her, I tell Six her, I recommend you get out of this mission now. And if you want, we'll help you save face. We'll have the doctor write up some rare condition that'll get you booted off, but still look good. But if you cause another problem, I can I give will. her a rare condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> so, so, um, does Jack have leadership as a skill? He does. Go ahead and make a leader, Hell yeah, Jack. Go ahead and make a leadership plus uh social. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. <laughs> well, there well, you go. Yeah, well the two and one didn't help. Um yeah. she he gets nothing. She um I mean obviously this is being dressed down by a superior. She uh, mm -hmm. smartly uh, stands at attention, and when you are are finished uh, dressing her down, she salutes and she asks, uh, "Will that be all, sir?" I say, "Look, this isn't about me being an officer. I wasn't an officer till I walked on this ship. I work every day just like you. This is about personnel problems. I will not have you jeopardizing my mission." She, uh, she. She says, I understand, sir. Very well. And uh, she goes on down the hall from you. All right. And during this time, when I make my daily walk through engineering and consult with the engineering team, I bring Mikhail and give, an or give him an orientation okay. of the engineering suites. Okay, yes. You... You can certainly do that. And so, um, and this is actually an excellent time to do that. So, so you are, you bring, uh, uh, him down and, uh, you're kind of not so much putting him to work yet, uh, so much as you are walking through engineering and, uh, and kind of, um, you know, pointing, saying what things, yeah, saying what things are. Yeah, kind of orienting him with what is going on and what people are actually uh, doing, and uh, you know what is required. And of course, uh, uh, you come upon uh, life support, and uh, I already forgot her fucking name. That's that's why I was bad at dating, uh, Chandra. Chandra, you, you uh, come across Chandra, who is uh, working on life support, and um, and she's, you know, uh, the ship is prepping uh, to exit jump space, 
And so, uh, you know, they're the sh the the crew is getting ready for to enact your uh, your procedures that are set up. And part of that is, of course, uh, as soon as you exit jump space, everybody, the engineering section is going to come alive with people running diagnostics and and recalibrating and, you know, whatever, and checking life support, things of that matter. And uh, Chandra looks up at, at, at Randolph and she says, um, well, if if it w if you would like, I can um, I can show him some things about life support. Yeah, so please uh, have him. Is there a chair next to her? Yeah, yeah. There's there's plenty of room. We have Mickey sit down in a chair next to her and have her watch, and she can talk through what she's doing. Okay. Tell so, him we're gonna test him later. <clears throat> so don't, don't, don't let him just fuck around. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> there was. There will be a multiple but, choice quiz. Um, yeah, but his dexterity is only six, so it's not going to work. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, no, I'm just saying that he's probably going to sit there and spend the whole time bullshitting with her rather than actually learn anything. So, right up front, let him know we're going to test him afterwards. That okay. very likely true. Yes, and so um, the ship. And I stand there and watch. The ship comes out of a jump. Uh, and then you are at Kitoy right here. He, he he's what the military would refer to as a malinger. Malinger, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and... actually, I I want to try and steal him away when I get a chance. But okay, Board I have a use, I, I have an idea for it. So, so the the can ship he, can they do any combat with it? I mean. He has jack of all trades. He can do anything. Well, that's true. Well, he has like jack of all trades one, but I mean, maybe not anything, but you know. So, <clears throat> Deep Knight Revelation comes out of jump in the. Uh, I'm going to just say toy system. I don't know how to pronounce that. And the uh, the sensors are picking up an object in the system as uh, Revelation makes for a, um, a belt of icy, uh, you know, just an ice, uh, ice chunk asteroid belt where it's going to use that to refuel. And they are picking up an object that is reflecting light from the star and other forms of radiation in an unusual manner. I think we need to take the science team and go check it out. Yeah, the, their their estimation is that whatever it is is 10 to 15 displacement tons. Its trajectory is inclined sharply to the plane of the current system and appears to be unstable. Um, it's not under its own power, but it may have been at some point as its current velocity would not be naturally achievable. So it's something that came from outside the solar system. Yes. I mean, maybe we can go and, I mean, if it's just, it's just on a trajectory, we don't believe it's being controlled. No, it's a, the, 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 uh, sensors crew is saying that in a few years, the object will spiral into the star, um, and they are back plotting the path and it suggests its trajectory was established in the past 20 or so standard years. We've got to at least go take a look at yep, it. Let's go check um, it out. Yeah. Can okay. we even? Is it going so fast? Can we even catch up with it? Oh, you can. Yeah, yeah. It's, we've it's got not very going nice. That we've and got it, like nice I said, it, it it appears to be kind of tumbling, and it's in an unstable, unstable orbit around the star, which is you know ultimately is going to um, dump dump it into the star itself. Uh, so, yeah. are you guys taking the uh, the Desinex? Yeah. Okay. That's a Roger. Who should we bring with us for this one? Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe a, another one of the sensors, folks. Okay. And uh, maybe an exo, somebody who's archaeology, somebody can help with identifying a you know if it is something that's out of the. It's like a geologist and maybe a uh, exo guy, a uh, space, you know, anth anthropologist. Uh, xenobiologist. Yeah, xenobiologist. I think a physicist. Sure. <laughs> what the hell? 
I just, I just want to make sure that whenever we do stuff, we're always bringing some crew along with us so that we're we're not everybody's not just getting pissed off that we're the only ones that could do anything. Right, right. Do um, we want to bring? Would you want to bring that tech with us? She no. can do comms and life support. Oh, really. do you want to bring Chandra, or I mean, uh, does Jack want to bring Mayek? I don't want uh, Jack. Is that Mike. the guy with the broken arm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. All right. So you're gonna there bring. You go. I want to make him. I want to make him my buddy. I got a plan for him. Okay. So That's you bring Smith and Wesson. You bring Mayek. What's that? I'm just gonna bring Smith and Wesson. <laughs> <laughs> my two favorite people. Um, and, and Randolph, did you uh, want to bring like Chandra, the, the life support tech? I'm a poor man. Just give me a Ruger. So, so did Randolph want to bring Chandra or are you? No. no? Okay. No. So you bring Mike and, uh, you bring an exobiologist. I got life support three, what so I, uh... I, also, I got engineer life support maneuver. I think I'm okay. Yeah. You probably have that covered. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, is uh, is there any way I can request an NPC uh, other random crew member? In fact, sure. I want to take and just randomly select a name and let like the 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 force just kind of bring bring in somebody that will be useful. And so uh, I am going to request the biggest person on the ship, that? whoever has the biggest mass. Did we did we recruit any of those guys from the last planet? <laughs> well, yeah, we could be. Did we recruit any of these humongous Ewoks? <laughs> no, I don't think we did. We actually recruited anybody. We just did some light trading and moved on. We got some. some we, we could make them though because we got DNA samples. So. Um... <clears throat> Actually, uh, there is another knight aboard. Uh, there is Sir Leon uh, Sivas, but you, going through your medical records, the the bulkiest crewman that you find is this gentleman, Enrique Delgatti, and uh, he perfect. His job is uh, essentially he works security. I love this guy. Yeah, I need him to assist me in <laughs> matters. Change uh, that orange to red. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's Perfect. A, he's a red shirt. Yeah, I like him. I, I'm gonna make sure to give him a good medical checkup and collect some of his DNA before we take <laughs> off, and, and we're good to go. So you guys load up and uh, and. Uh, your your various additional crew. Um... Like Sebo Cephas creating like a lottery basket that could spin. It has a little ball with everybody's name and the crew on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> who comes on the next assignment? So you you uh, leave uh, Deep Night and uh, you are heading for deeper into these into this. Uh, icy asteroid belt it, it, it essentially this 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 belt looks like if a comet just a, a real a planet-sized comet just got torn apart and is circling the outer outer edge of this system and uh deep night itself of course can't really enter these belts because it'll get all kinds of dented and dinged up but your small craft can and uh, it is sending numerous small craft, uh, pinnaces, and um, and launches to collect uh, water that they can then bring back to the ship. You're probably, because of this, uh, because it is not a, a gas giant skimming situation, you're probably looking at closer to a week being here. Um, but, Jack, go ahead and make a uh, piloting spacecraft plus dexterity check. As you enter the icy field, good boy. Ooh, not good. So, you guys, have we fixed our Should ship? Us seven the leeches last. Uh... Yeah, the the, yeah. the crew, the uh, maintenance crews have have uh, fixed her up. So, oof, and. We 
tied. That's good. Uh, so the the Desinex, uh there is a loud bang, and you guys are all kind of jarred as the ship kind of the the inertial dampeners inside kind of uh, lose lose gravity control for a split second. You guys are all kind of thrown for a second as the ship is bumped and kind of lurches. Um, and the ship takes two points of hull damage. Uh, there's a big dent and scratch on the side of it. <laughs> Jack just keeps flying. Like, uh, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Robin is racing. I'm still breathing. But as you guys get closer to this object, uh, who wants to make a sensor scan and get a little bit more information here? I'll have, the, I'll have the sensor guy that I brought on. Yeah, I'll have the sensor guy that I brought on make the scan, and then I'll bat, I'll do a, a check on my own to okay. So confirm. He, he has an education one and electronic sensors two. So go ahead and roll two d six plus three. All right. So this is him. He did, he did okay. Okay. So and I'm ch I'm double checking him, and I got a ten. So so he he uh, kind of reaches out with the sensors, <clears throat> and actually uh, that would probably be an additional plus two. Um, so he he scans out with the sensors and he pulls up an image of what looks like a fragment of a large starship, and it looks. From from what you're seeing on the sensors, <clears throat> it looks like it comes up in a holographic display. It looks like it was an open space, like maybe a part of a storage hold or maybe a docking bay. And the edges of this thing are all jagged, like it was ripped off of whatever ship it was on. Oh no, space dragons. <laughs> I mean, that's that's interesting as shit. I, I, God, do you think it would be possible for us to dock with that thing? It was some really nifty piloting. We, we might be able to get on, yeah, uh, and and get on in there and and see what's there. I, I mean, you know, we've we've come all this way. Is is my friend Urkel uh, able to uh, put on vac suits and shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all able yeah, to. Get, Fuck yeah! I mean, man. the only the only one that would be questionable would be uh, um, Mayek, simply because his one arm is in a in a gel cast from wrist to shoulder. So, right. I mean, uh, I don't really want to leave him on the ship alone. Um, Just dose so... him up some painkiller and force that arm in there. Fuck well, yeah, man. <laughs> Some of that gin with hallucin mild hallucinogenics. You know, I'll tell you what, man. You know, I'll, it later. I can combat drug him. Uh and you know, he'll I mean he'll have a hard come down. His combat uh, drugs well, don't last very red, long. He's a red shirt and they all have a hard come down. But, but no, I mean can I make a medical check to try to uh help him get into his back suit uh with uh, yeah. As least it's covered as possible. Yeah, go ahead and make a medic plus education blah, blah, check. Blah. Yeah. I mean, I'm really kind of good at this shit. And I know some weird ways that the body works, you know? <laughs> you uh, dislocate this, you pull that. Yeah, it doesn't really hurt there anymore. And then, little, you know. Chakra work. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to check your colon. Oh, your arm is in the damn uh, suit. <laughs> so there you... you know. <laughs> you are you are able to kind of uh, get him in. You dose him with a, a, a mix of anti-anxiety and pain meds and get him into a spacesuit. Then the question is, what kind of spacesuits are you guys throwing on? Are you throwing on standards? What are you, what are you wearing? Hazard. Hazard? Hell yeah. Yeah, I'm wearing the full thing. I actually... I actually have a combat hazard suit of my own. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, this is the hostile environment suit, which that right there. for this probably seems a little bit overkill, but, you know, um, if, if that's what you guys are wearing, this is the general vac suit. Um, 
which is probably what um, you know Mayak and uh, and your your exobiologist and your sensors operator are wearing. And Urkel. And, uh, yeah, and Urkel. Yeah, Urkel. Yeah, the, well, I don't that's know what his, forever going to be his name. His name is Urkel now. Yeah, yeah, that's forever going to be his name now. And I'm wearing my personal combat envir- environment yeah, he, suit. He probably tried to correct us the first ten times we called him that. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, yeah, yeah, man, all right, yeah, no problem. Yeah, but after Urkel, about the know? fifth or sixth time, he was just like, okay, yeah, that's my name. I'm it's, putting on my my own personal vac suit. Okay. It's, it's still Do you my, guys want me to stay on check. the ship in case there's a problem? Why don't, um, we, why don't we get close and see what the issue is, right? Well, we I mean, that. yeah, you're our pilot, though, if if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, right. Let's, but let's let's get close and figure out what we're looking at, and then then we can make decisions to who Fair stays enough. and who goes. So yeah. you a lucky guy's got your personal vac suits and your armor on, and here I am thinking I'm lucky I put on pants this morning. So <laughs> uh, you know, well, I am uh, bringing my extendo shield and and ready yeah. to go. You know, with my I'm medical stay supplies. On the ship with Jack. Okay, so Jack. No, I mean, I meant the scout ship. Right. You're exploring some wreckage, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Jack needs yeah, to make. Just... If you're going to match velocity and rotation, Jack needs to make another piloting plus dex check. Oh boy. Damn. And wow. uh, it it is taking him a while. Ooh, snake eyes. Don't you? Shouldn't Holy you look up here? Shouldn't Jack. there be some some incident from the box cars? Ice field. Snake eyes. <laughs> or the or the items tumbling. So he So this is actually a bit fortuitous. So in his attempt to match rotation, he's matched speed. And, but he hasn't matched rotation and he bumps it. Just kind of not enough to do damage, but he just just nudges it. Which Bumps it away, but it has stopped this this chunk of of whatever from tumbling. Uh, Jack, Isn't that you, nice? Jack, you can make another piloting plus dex check, and you get a plus two uh, to the roll because it is no longer it is no longer tumbling. That's better. So, Holy shit! So so I can pass an eight if you give me a six. <laughs> yes. So, so Jack comes up and uh, and is able to not necessarily. I mean, there's nothing to dock to. So, but he's able to match rotation and kind of stay in position. You guys would be essentially be opening the airlock here, uh, which I assume is where is the airlock? That's the ship's where? locker. Oh, so, in terms of. As we're approaching this thing, I want to scan it for life forms and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, you guys go downstairs. Uh, yeah, go ahead and make a electronic sensors plus uh, intellect or education. And you get a plus two to that. All right. So we're going to use an, a, 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 a tethering system? Yeah, you essentially know, you're going to be uh, jumping out of this airlock and leaping across. To land on right, thing. but I, I I still want to tether to the Dresnex and and you know we, uh, you know while we make our jump that way if we miss or or you know roll like like Gabriel there, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll at least <laughs> not just go out into space. I mean, if you want to detach from your de- tether when you get to the to the wreckage. Uh, that's a different story, but you know. So essentially, maybe we can use Urkel as an anchor of the tether. So essentially, you know, you're big. going to have to send one person over, and essentially, you're probably wanting to send the person with the best vac suit skill, and uh, they're going to go over, attach the tether, and then whoever else can attach to it and slide on down. I have vac one. I have so vac got, one. So I got a sixteen on my scan. Yeah. So your your life scan um, comes up negative. Uh, the, it does show some uh, some some biological material. Um, Is it fungal in nature? No. 
<laughs> it, it doesn't match it doesn't match any scans that you've taken before but it is showing that there is biological material um iron carbon things of that nature um but you're oh, not we're gonna... you're not detecting any heat signatures or or other than what's reflected off from the star you're not detecting we're... anything that would denote that there's somebody living on this thing we're definitely making the geologist and the exobiologist go with us <laughs> So, so who has the the best vac suit, Skull? I have vac one. One. Yeah. What complementary skill do you want to go with it? It's probably Dex. It would be would Dex imagine. in this case, yeah. I've got two total with vac suit one and Dex one. I have Dex zero. Vac one. My uh, vac suit does have mag mag. Then you go, Sarda. Magnet plates. Yeah, we'll we'll tether you uh, to the deep night uh, to the Dresnex and just let you do your jump, or we can have Urkel throw you. <laughs> Dwarf tossing. <laughs> uh, I think I could rather uh, make the attempt on my own. Okay. Right. Uh, well, you know, we're bringing them out. So I do I do have tactical video suite set up on my back suit, so I am recording everything. So, Sarda, go ahead and make a vac suit plus dex check to make... And it's not a very far crossing. It, I mean, you're you're literally talking about 10 meters. Of course, Can you're I... in space, so looking at, looking at the open airlock, you're like, holy shit, that's a long ways. It's, it's really not... It's not nearly as far as it looks. I got an eight. Okay, perfect. So, Sarda... I should, I should, um, should have had thrusters added to this suit. I screwed up. So Sarda is attached to to the desk next, and he leaps from the from the uh, airlock and sets down rather smoothly on this other on on this open chunk of ship. And the, does the magnet work on this other ship or no? It does. It does. You, okay, so it is Ferris. Yeah, of some sort. your mag your mag boots attach, and you're able to attach the mag end of this tether line to the ship. And so everybody else can go ahead and make their slide down. Um, everybody else, go ahead and make a dex, or a, a vac suit plus dex, and you get to add a plus two to that because you are tethered. I'll roll for the two NPCs we're forcing to come with us. Holy shit, that guy did great. Both of them kicked ass. I, I have no idea what their bonus or penalty is. Uh, I just rolled the plus two that, for being tethered. I rolled the six. Okay, so can I can I try to use telekinesis to push myself back on path? So Mayak goes down ahead of Bocephus. Bocephus <laughs> tangled. Yeah, Bocephus is on his way down, and the, I mean, for lack of a better term, it's just a carabiner, kind of hangs up on the on the tether line, and Bocephus is going like this around the tether line midway and kind of stuck you can this go is... ahead and use a telekinesis push if you would like yeah i think i want to do that because that's everybody else is stunned two rounds due to the laughter yeah all right it's all it really funny is it. what happens to you yeah well there how about that okay, i got an so 11 yeah you you essentially use telekinesis to either grab on to what you're what you're heading towards or push off from the desk next and you're able to shove yourself down the line and uh Mayak Mayak makes a makes a comment he's like well that I mean I I'm no expert but that doesn't look like something that physics would do <laughs> it's because well see here's the secret is when you know you're going to do this you eat a lot of cabbage <laughs> And <laughs> and when you see yourself going off course, you have to fart, and it has to go at the direct angle. You, you'll space. notice that Bocephus' yeah, spacesuit has a little button flap in the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so all of you can make uh, well, you a, know. well, everybody except for George and, and Jack. Um, so Bocephus, Randolph, and Sarda, you can make a uh, recon plus intellect check. Wow, 
Wow. Okay. So you guys, wow. you three, kind of look around, and you can determine that. So, like I said, this is a, a an open space. So it looks like it was part of maybe a cargo hold or a docking bay, and there are a there are hatches and an arrangement of space that suggests that whoever the crew of this ship was was roughly human sized and you can see that there are um these hatches they're they're not like the the iris hatches that you're used to on imperial ships they they are more like a submarine kind of hatch but there are sections of other compartments that that include parts of a floor wall and ceiling on the other side that have just been literally torn off of whatever ship this thing was attached to but what you can determine by these hatches in these compartments is that the, it was a roughly human sized crew you do see um and randolph you find that there are uh, what appears to be like blood smears on one of the walls. Gee, maybe I'll point my hand scanner at it. Okay. So, um, both Cephas will remind everybody that uh, opening a pressurized compartment while in zero G there's, space there's nothing is highly that, unwise. There is nothing here that's compressurized, that is pressurized. Uh, uh, everything... Oh, I, Everything on the other side of these hatches, the hatches themselves are not sealed, and the compartment on the other side is ripped to shit. And so, like yeah. I said, this whole this whole oh. chunk that you're standing on is only about 15 d tons. Right. Well, okay. Let's, let's well. look for anything. Let's look for computer chips. Uh, let's get yeah. metals. Let's get metal samples of how stuff's made. Biological samples. Yeah. Um, and and any kind of uh, hard drives or anything like so, that. Could we hypothetically bring this into the ship? Uh, is it big enough? That is it too big? Uh, for... Yeah, you could. You have a cargo. You have cargo capacity of seventeen tons, and this thing is only fifteen. Let's, so, let's yeah, take it. Yeah. Let's let's take the whole thing. If we've matched speed, let's uh, and we've got a harpoon. Let's get a few more harpoons let's on it, it and let's guide it Fuck in. Yeah. Okay. Urkel. Yeah, Urkel, pull us in. <laughs> so. So yeah, um, well, you guys kind of tow this thing in, and you get it into your uh, cargo hold down here in number twenty, and it it takes up pretty much a whole hold. I mean, there there's literally two D tons worth of space for you to maneuver around. Um, Bocephus, go ahead and make a science biology plus education check. Yeah, we need to let's let's treat it as if it's possibly contaminated. And, uh, you know, and and so and Bocevis, you get to add a plus two to that because of your your scanning equipment. You know, I still uh, before I I uh, do this, uh, would it be okay if I? Uh, a little psionic woo woo and get a plus one to the roll. Yeah. From my awareness. Yeah, go and make go and make an look. awareness check. Yeah. I'm a So and don't don't forget you're down um what? Um Well I'm looking at my telekinesis. Yeah, telekinesis thing. is I one use, point per ten yeah. kilograms. Yeah. So I don't know I'm, how much you I'm weigh, good. but Right. You're down I was that at much. zero G too, so That's true. So I'd yeah, say at least so, half that. Mass. All right. Mass. Yeah. How, how about I? That's take true. Off, mass is mass. Yeah. I'll take off four points. That sounds good. Yeah. All right. So I'm currently at eight, which is okay. My awareness is at two, so I'll get a plus two to this this roll. And what I'm rolling for under the um. Well, da, 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 fortitude, inspiration is what I'm wanting to do. It gives okay. me a plus two to any one check that I trapped within the next one minute. Gotcha. And, yeah, so that's that's what I'm doing. So this will be at plus two because I have an awareness of two. 
Blam! Eight on the dot. Yeah. So you get a plus one. To, uh, you're down one more side point, and you get uh, a plus one to your it's science, plus biology, two. plus education check. It's a plus two. Or a plus two. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Plus two. Well, it's a uh, damn good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing you did that. So you uh, are able, with your science biology, you are able to determine um, that the blood smears, uh, well, first of all, you don't find any fungal infection. Um, second. That's, that's the main focus. That, that, that's, sure. Yeah, you don't find <laughs> any fungal infection. I want to get my flame gun and hose this thing down. You, you don't find any fungal infection. Um, the blood sample that you took um, shows that the crew are roughly humanoid and comfortable in similar atmospheric and gravity conditions as humans. Um, yeah, and there, yeah, there is no sign of contamination of the, by the Deep Knight entity. Randolph, uh, you can go ahead and make a uh, electronic sensors plus intellect or education, and you get a plus two to that. <coughs> because of your hand scanner. Okay. So, Randolph, you scan it. Um, you find out a couple of interesting things. The first thing that you find out is that um, due to the um, the mesh work in the the deck plating, you determine that the vessel was built at about TL9 or approximately close to that, um, and it appears that the ship uh, was jump capable. Um, your estimation is that the the ship was the ship that whatever this was torn off of was around four to 5,000 uh, displacement tons, uh, but given its low technology, um, you estimate that the ship was probably an exploration ship rather than a freighter or a warship. And you're not, on this, this small 15-ton section, you're not, deter you, you're, you're not seeing any, any uh, hard points for turrets or fixed weapons. Um, and last, Sarda, you can go ahead and make a. Um, well, uh, what 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 kind of uh, what do you what do you want to investigate, Sarda? Well, I mean, if it was jump capable, I definitely would want to anything I could find out about the jump way the jump system works. That'd be great. I would ask the physicist if he can try to figure out trajectory, get an idea of where this thing may have come from. Uh, I don't know if he has astrogation, but that might help him determine, you know, if it came from outside the system, uh, you know, where where did it come from? We know it, it wasn't – this accident you said only happened like 20, 25 years ago, right? Right. So it couldn't have occurred too far away, you know, for, in terms of like ex outside our system, right? You know, 25 years of light year – you know, 25 years of that speed is not does, very big does, distance. Does sort of have mechanic – uh yeah i technically do Then make a, a I mean, mechanic i mean i have i have engineering jump drive four but i mean yeah i have go, go ahead and make well. an engineering <laughs> jump drive plus uh intellect or education check sure can we uh can we get one of you guys that you know do all astrogation or navigation or whatever uh to maybe maybe backtrack the trajectory that, of this thing and let's maybe... we brought in a, we brought in a science physicist for exactly this type of thing so right yeah he, he, he didn't jump over to the thing he stayed on board the ship so that he you know do, yeah he let him trajectory on the ship so yeah, we have all that information already from our scans and everything else you know where it was going the direction the rate right. but if this accident only occurred 20 25 years ago it couldn't have come that far right i mean that's that's nothing at that speed in terms of space and from system to system, you can't even get one system away at that speed. Yeah. So well, yeah. You know, you're talking Do less than a light yeah. year. So yeah. your your astrophysicist uh, calls down from the the bridge with uh, George and and Jack and tells you that uh, he's run a scan. Uh, no other wreckage uh, of this type can be found in the ice field. Um, but um, Sarda, you going over it, the the damage that you're seeing to the jump grid 
on on the on the external. So uh, ships have a a jump grid that it's supposed to prevent um, essentially jump space from penetrating your your jump bubble and entering the ship. That's bad. Sure. You don't want that. Sure. Yeah, I would imagine. And you say what you're seeing is that it that the damage suggests that there was a catastrophic jump emergence. Um, it was that the damage here was not from combat or a collision, and uh, you find um, so this is a really bad miss jump. Yeah, it was a really bad miss jump. Um, the other thing that you guys are able to determine is that the ship has standard would have what you would call standard electronics. But none of these were, it, it was clearly not developed with any influence from charted space. And there is no records or data available in any of the, the computer consoles that remain. Um, essentially, these were just dumb terminals that were connected right. to a okay. main computer core. And since it has been ripped away from that, um, there's nothing else. Um, your oh, ad- boy. VT-150. <laughs> I will allow Jack. We'll tell tell the clients. Jack, you can go ahead and make an astrogation plus uh, intellect or education check. Well, when we get this back to the deep night, we're going to need it just dismantled piece by piece and and cataloged and noted. Uh, we need to name the species in this this wreckage for record purposes. And uh, and then just you know recycle its parts as best we can. So yeah, um, well I mean it, it, it as far as naming the species, it will be cataloged under some uh, probably Latin or Volani Volani version of Latin name with a designation number because you don't you're not you don't know what the species is going to look like. Um, Except you, blood, oh, well, uh, except even, have back for that long. Except may not, he's going to, hey. except he's going to put the DNA in a clone and vac. It may not be viable. It. It may not yeah, be it's probably not viable due to solar well, radiation. We and, don't know if the, though. Blood, if the blood's been, but you know, in effect, uh, all I'm hearing is if. And, so and, and, while you guys were all doing this, Jack uh, ran an astrogation uh, matrix and was able to backtrack uh, where this thing uh, essentially came from and it, it yeah that should be a 10 actually yeah it, it comes from deeper uh like essentially it comes deeper in the direction that you're you're heading um but much further uh, further away and he, and he is he's detecting that um he can it's not possible to exactly pinpoint but he knows the general direction is it, okay. is it a direction we're headed? More, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, then that's a that's a we need to make an intelligence report based on what we found here. At least, you know, we can't say that they're not warlike people or anything, but at least you know the ship we found shows they're open to exploration. Uh, that is not so war. Are we able to get into the electronics and get any any digital uh, information from mm-hmm. these? These no, people? there's no records or anything saved. Nothing else. No data survived. Any kind of characters or anything that would suggest what kind of writing they might use or uh, anything like that? There, we yeah, have there, the there's probably some, like, uh, what a, what would appear to be uh, drawings or or maybe letters on some buttons. You, you're, what you are discovering, I mean, TL9... Not a whole lot of touchscreen activity going on. There's still a lot of or holographic controls. It, there's, oh, yeah. There are physical buttons and knobs. So yeah, there is some writing, uh, but like I said, the electronics uh, are clearly they would be standard electronics that you you understand how they're put together, but they clearly do not have any influence from any race that you've ever encountered. So we'll put, the, the, put, the, we'll put the xenobiologist on this, have him just pour over everything, trying to find anything that might help us. If we run yeah. into this race in the future, you know, a way that would maybe help us identify that race. Take, uh, take a linguist. Do we have a, we have a linguist? Them. Yeah, and the linguist can, can see if they can cross-reference what they're seeing as far as characters and things with with known databases. See right. if we can get a kind of a you know, 
Yeah, and, and, we, and your yeah. research yeah. teams aboard uh, Revelation can can pour over this this fifteen ton chunk of of ship and probably get more data than you guys can in the cargo hold of your. All right. Yeah. This, yeah. I'm, I'm just. Yeah. That, and if I remember right, we brought a piece of equipment that can do. Tr- do linguistal stuff. Yes, you have. You you do have a um, a translator uh, computer. It is. So I assume the science I think it needs, staff I think it needs it. quite a bit of. So these. I tests, would agree. I they, would agree. It's, they, there's no word. It looks kind of like this. It's designed to take down onto a planet with you. Um, uh, translation analysis unit. Um, essentially, now. The way this thing reads is that it specifically can listen to people talking, um, but at the tech level that this thing would be available, I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be a camera. So it can probably um, it can probably visually process data as well, but I I doubt that it has a powerful enough AI to. Uh, it's helpful, but it is not foolproof, because we all know how the Villani feel about AI. They they they're like, uh, uh-uh, uh, we don't like that. So, so don't expect it to have Chat GPT or anything like that. I think we we, we, you know, we can we can work on that on the on the way back. But uh, when the expert teams come and start dissecting it, I mean they're going to give us pretty good results. I think. So we will pick this up next week uh, with you guys back aboard uh, the in, or uh, the uh, Revelation, and uh, continuing on your way and, tr- and probably following this route uh, to see exactly. Where this thing emerged from jump and and what what happened to these people? So after this occurred, we had Miek with us the whole time. So yeah. basically, say okay. So you sort of see once you have a expertise of some sort, you get to do crazy shit. So does anything sound appealing to you? Yeah, he. So <laughs> so after coming back in, so. Uh, Initially, when you pushed him out the airlock, you could see through the faceplate that he was a little pale, maybe sweating a little bit. But then after busted arm, (laughs) yeah, with his busted arm. But then after he got over to the other side, and you know, did some investigation and whatnot with you guys, and and you guys towed it back into the cargo bay. He's he's feeling pretty damn confident about himself. He's like, you know, let's let you know, I want to do more of this. That, That was great. Yeah, certainly so, better than certainly better than uh, uh, pushing things around the deck. How, right, how sorting Urkel, silverware. Uh, how did Urkel feel about the excursion? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he he works in security. He's he was he was pretty okay with it. I mean, um, he was probably towing the thing in. Yeah, yeah, he towed it in. He's like, you know, you know, this is. Uh, this isn't any different than than my usual uh, Monday through Friday. So, you know. Uh, yeah. Does he know of? Uh, I mean, so he is he a uh, what kind of combat is is he skilled in? He. That's a good question. So uh, he has uh, gun combat slug uh, two, and uh, he's got. Melee unarmed at zero. Uh-huh. All right. So you can Myers? put cuffs on. Is that who you're talking about? No, uh, Urkel, the security oh. guy. Okay. Yeah. The big He's guy. The big, big guy. guy with the glasses. Yeah, we need to get him to work and learn some new skills. And uh, it's Enrique Delgaldi. That's the one, Enrique. Yeah. Urkel. Urkel. Yeah. So I. I want Mayak to become my little buddy because I'm going to make him into a... I think the area he can shine in is in supply. He should be able to get a hold of illegal shit when I need to find something odd. Yeah, he's a bit of a bullshitter, that, but as long as he's honest with me, that is he should a be all right. very at likely scenario. Items. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a very likely scenario. So. Okay. He uh, can start hanging out with me. All Sounds right. good. 
we will pick this up next week at 7 o'clock on Friday night for the next episode of Deep Night Revelation. Have a wonderful right. night. You too. Thanks, sir. I will yeah, see good you weekend, tomorrow, everybody. Wes. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there, too. Eh? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And yep. uh, and happy Father's Day to the single moms out there, because you doing it, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>